Hello, Advent Anglican. Here we are on this second Sunday in Eastertide. Look at this spectacular place I found, a new place for us to worship. I think we'll worship here for a few weeks, um, but just look how glorious it is around us. Can you believe it? So um, um, it's time now for you to take just a few seconds to make sure you've got everything you need for worship. We're gonna put a screen up there with some background music and um, it's a chance for you to just make sure you've gathered everything that you need. Remember, we can't go to church, so it's our job to bring church to us. Get the items that you need, a Bible, your bulletin, and um, on this Sunday, uh, we're going to need some bread and wine. If you have those, I would encourage you to get those. And um, we're not going to be doing communion, but we are going to be doing an, a symbol and a remembrance of communion this morning. So it won't be communion, but uh, I wanna encourage you to get some bread and wine if you've got some. And um, we're gonna partake of those as a way of longing for our return to communion eventually. So take a moment to do that now as we put some music up there again. Happy Easter, it's still Easter tide, remember that? And, um, and hopefully things go smoother this Sunday than they did last Sunday. But grab some bread and wine, grab your Bible, grab your bulletin, and also get a pen and a note so that you can write a note to someone at the passing of the peace. All right, I'm gonna get in position and get ready. I'm gonna get all my stuff that I need and let's go to church. Well, hello again, Advent Anglican. It's good to be gathered with you in this unique way. But look at this gorgeous sanctuary that we have around us. And uh, here we are in Eastertide. Spring abounds with life and vitality. The resurrection is visible in the earth around us. So let's enter into Easter worship. Stand, please, as able, wherever you are. And being as it is now in Eastertide on the second Sunday of Easter, we open with these words. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let's join our voices together now as we sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he has done O oh, perfect redemption the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of God the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Glory, 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 give him glory, great things he has done. Glory, 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 give him glory, great things he has done. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, give him glory, great things he has done. Glory, glory, 
glory, glory, give him glory, great things he has done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. In just a moment, I'll ask you to be seated now, but first, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, Grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Go ahead and be seated now as we listen to our first lesson. A reading from the book of Acts. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will always dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that, we are all witnesses. The word of the Lord. Our response appointed for today is Psalm 16. And in Eastertide, we're saying these in unison. So would you please join your voices with me as we say together Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land, Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's listen now to the second lesson. A reading from the book of 1 Peter. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. I want to invite you wherever you're at now to stand, please, as we sing our gospel anthem and listen to our gospel reading. We will first sing the refrain and first verse and refrain again of our gospel anthem. Then we'll listen to the reading and we'll sing the gospel anthem again with the third verse that second time through. Let's sing. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Jesus Christ according to John chapter 20 verses 19 through 31 on the evening of that day the first day of the week the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews Jesus came and stood among them and said to them peace be with you when he had said this he showed them his hand and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father hath sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and placed my finger into the mark of the nails, and placed my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them again, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this, in this book. 
But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sisters, once again, I'm going to attempt to share a very short devotional thought in lieu of a full sermon. This is as much as I can muster while I'm on paternity leave, and I'm going to take you for a walk again. Isn't it beautiful where we are here? I mean, it's just spectacular everywhere I look, especially this time of year. You can see off in the distance the mountains, and uh, across from me here is just this spectacularly green pasture. It's beautiful everywhere. Well, it's interesting this time of year. This Sunday always surprises me because it's the second Sunday in the season of Easter. And you know, you you have Easter Sunday with all of its triumph and then immediately the next Sunday you go into this Sunday where the gospel lesson, as you heard from Father Father Bruce's reading, um, the gospel lesson focuses not on the triumph of Easter, but in fact on the dubiousness of Thomas. So we end up with every Easter 2, as this is this Sunday is called, every year on Easter 2, um, we have a reflection on doubt, which seems to sort of undercut the general momentum of belief in the resurrection, sort of direction that you would think we would want people to go with their thoughts and their hearts. But it's important, I think, and quite valuable that every year the message of resurrection is met with the sort of respect of doubt. We've cast Thomas as sort of our uh, poster child for this. He's the perfect candidate. He's the one we look to for doubt. We call him, in fact, Doubting Thomas. Poor guy. Can you imagine? That's the title that he ended up with. (laughs) I'm sure someday we'll meet him and he'll reject that title if we try to call him that. He does come around in the end, though, doesn't he? which is why the Orthodox have chosen to call him Believing Thomas, which I think is a much more admirable and fitting title for him. What else do we know about Thomas? Not a whole lot, honestly. He strikes me as someone who's kind of brash, similar to Peter. A recent reading we had uh, is Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus. And you'll recall there's this sort of delay and this long conversation that precedes that moment in which Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples that Lazarus is dead, but he's using terminology of asleep. And um, there's a debate about whether or not they should even go because it's very dangerous if they go. And so um, Thomas is the one who speaks up and says, when Jesus says that he is going to go, Thomas is the one who speaks up and says, let's go with him that we might die also. It's a fairly intense and zealous response. I suppose I can respect that about Thomas. I think that's an interesting attribute of his. But that intensity can kind of cut both ways, can't it? That in one moment, that kind of a personality can be so convinced that they're willing to die along with someone. And then in the next moment, they can say, I will never believe unless unless this and this. I will never believe. Some of us have that sort of... um, I don't know, binary intensity. It's all or nothing. It's completely yes or completely no. And we perhaps struggle to live in the middle realm that I think is perhaps more fitting to faith. That tension where we say, um, I believe. I don't know, 
but I believe. I have reason to believe, cause to believe, and, um, but I, I don't have that certainty. And I think Thomas represents the sort of person who struggles with that, that middle posture. Well, what's fascinating to me is that Thomas is in that room and he says, I'll never believe in less. And really, there's, there's a sort of fairness that we miss out on with Thomas because, see, what Thomas needs is something that the rest of them have already been granted, which is actually seeing Jesus, encountering him. And so it's not unfair that Thomas says, I want that before I believe. Because really all he's saying is, hey, you guys needed it. I need it too. And it wasn't enough for him to just hear from them that they had received it. He wants it for himself. Again, I can respect that. It's not enough for us to simply hear about the encounters that others have had with Jesus. We need to have our own. I wonder if you've had that personal encounter with Jesus. Or if instead you resonate with Thomas before he has had that post-resurrection encounter. You find yourself among the disciples of Jesus and you feel like you're one of them, but there's perhaps something lacking in your own connection and in your own faith. And maybe you've taken to hiding the doubt that you have rather than boldly proclaiming it like Thomas does in that moment. Maybe you feel like doubt is inappropriate and so it's something that you need to cover up. I don't think it is. In fact, I think Thomas is for us a reminder that doubt is something God can work with. So for those of you who find yourself struggling with doubt, particularly in a time of uncertainty like this, I want to encourage you not to hide your doubt, nor hide from your doubt, but to name it. Because see, when Thomas decides to say, this is what I need in order to believe, He's opened an avenue for that belief to come alive again. He's essentially told God what it is he's waiting for. And here's a funny thing about God. He seems to be willing to work with us. He seems to be willing to accept the strange things that we do require in order to understand and believe. He seems throughout the story of Scripture to be willing to meet people where they are and offer them what they want, whether it's reasonable or not. There are limits, of course, but by and large, I see God as wanting to work with people. And when Thomas declares, here's what I need, I need to touch him, what does God do? Does God send him a messenger and say, how dare you ask for that? Not at all. Quite to the contrary, God actually shows up, Jesus, shows up and gives him exactly what it is he wanted. Let's him put his hands in his side. Let's him touch him and encounter him in the way that all the other disciples had already done. But Jesus essentially honors Thomas's request and says, this is what you said you needed in order to believe. But here's the thing. Doubt should not be something we hide or hide from. But neither is it something that we indulge. You see, Jesus' response is twofold. His response is to show up and give Thomas what Thomas is longing for, what Thomas needs in order to believe. But his response after that is to say, now that you've got it, don't doubt, believe. And Thomas does. He eschews his doubt, he kicks it away, and he says, I believe, my Lord and my God. Wonderful declaration of faith. Doubt is not something to fear. In fact, it's natural. And Thomas is sort of an iconic representation of the fact that sometimes doubt is warranted and shades of doubt will always be with us, I'm sure. But he's also a representation of the fact that when God gives us what we need in order to believe and I would dare say it's often some form of encounter with him, that when God gives us that thing that substantiates faith, to choose faith as the response. So, 
Maybe you still need some sort of encounter like that with God in order to believe. Maybe he hasn't met you yet where you are. Maybe it's time for you to say what it is you need from him. Not something that forces him to be someone that he's not. But what is it about the God of the Bible that you need to encounter in your life? I want to encourage you to declare to him your need. Make it a need for him to say, Lord, I need to meet you. And I need to meet you in a particular way right now. And if, Lord, you would meet me this way, it would be my honor to get rid of doubt and to believe. I encourage you to express that doubt to the Lord if, in fact, it's something that you're living with. Let Thomas be the one who gives you permission for that. But then also, let Thomas be the one who guides you in your response. Let Thomas be not just doubting Thomas, but believing Thomas a mentor to you, not just in acknowledging the doubts that you have, but in choosing to leave them behind. May God give you that encounter that you need so that you may, with Thomas, call him your Lord and your God and may join him in obedience to Jesus' final word, which is, be not doubting, but believing. May God give you faith this Easter tide, even as you lift up to him the doubts that remain for you. God bless you. Amen. Well, it's time now to respond to God's word. And I want to invite you again, wherever you're at, to please stand. And let's join our voices together, affirming our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed saying, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear family of Christ, I exhort you in that same name to apply your efforts now in the ministry of prayer, considering it your duty as disciples and your privilege as sons and daughters of God our Father. Lift up your thanksgivings and petitions and be not silent. Declare your dependence on the Lord and come before him with prayerful hearts. We look to you for help, O Sovereign Lord. You are our refuge. Accept our prayers as incense offered to you. Come, Christians, labor in prayer. Pray for the church, for its members and its mission. Pray for this community, our nation, and for the welfare of the world. Pray for your own cares and the concerns of any with whom you share life. Give thanks to the Lord. Testify to his loving kindness to you and to those you love. If you're participating now on Facebook, please type your prayers into the comments. If you're participating through our website, instead either write your prayers on your bulletin or close your eyes and pray silently. And after a time, I will close with a collect.
water level rising, Livy almost broke. All the politicians have gone up in smoke. You take up your cross, I'll take mine. We'll go up to higher ground and wait out the time. Jesus, don't pass us by. Jesus, don't tarry now. Some say you won't return. Jesus, it might as well be. Should not be troubled for the Bible to say War tribulation will greet the final day Brother share the gospel, sister do the same Sing the saintly chorus till we join that refrain Jesus don't pass us by Jesus don't tarry now some say you won't return Jesus, it might as well be tonight Water level rising, Livy almost broke All the politicians have gone up in smoke You take up your cross, I'll take mine We'll go up to higher ground and wait out the time Jesus, don't pass us by Jesus, don't tarry now some say you won't return Jesus, it might as well be tonight We should not be troubled for the Bible to say War tribulation will greet the final day Brother, share the gospel, sister, do the same. Sing the saintly chorus till we join that refrain. Jesus, don't pass us by. Jesus, don't tarry now. Some say you won't return. Jesus, it might as well be. Water level rising, Livy almost broke All the politicians have gone up in smoke You take up your cross, I'll take mine We'll go up to higher ground and wait out the time Jesus, don't pass us by Jesus, don't tarry now some say you won't return
return Jesus, it might as well be tonight We should not be troubled for the Bible to say War, tribulation will greet the final day Brother, share the gospel, sister, do the same. Sing the saintly chorus till we join that refrain. Would you please close up your petitions? Finish typing them out if you're typing them or writing them out if you're handwriting. And I'm going to close our time of prayer with our closing collect. This comes from Solomon's words at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings. Listen to our prayer and our plea, O Lord our God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servants are making to you today. May you always hear the prayers we make in this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from your people when we pray. And when you hear, forgive. We pray to you, Lord, also for the forgiveness of our sins, saying together, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God grant you forgiveness of all your sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And I hear you saying, and also with you. Our words now for the offertory. You shall rejoice in the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. I want you to do three things now as we go to a cutaway screen. I want you to take a moment to make an offering, either to Advent or to the ministry of your choice. I want you also to reach out to someone in Christ's name and offer them a note of encouragement. I suggest you do it handwritten if you can, but you can also send someone a text message or something like that and greet them in Christ's name. And then thirdly, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get some bread and wine uh, because when we come back, we will be um, observing the symbol of the Eucharist in its absence. Please go ahead and do those three things now. There's a story old that is often been told of how our Savior died. As they nailed his hands, he cried, They don't understand. As the blood flowed from his side, how can you? can you refuse him now? How can you turn away from his side? With tears in his eyes on the cross there he died. How can you refuse Jesus now? As he hung there on the tree
can you refuse him now? How can you refuse him now? How can you turn away from his side? With tears in his eyes, on the cross there he died. How can you refuse Jesus now? How can you refuse Jesus now? Okay, brothers and sisters, if you would finish up those three items and find your bulletin, it's time now for remembering the Eucharist. Dear people of God, though we be scattered, the Lord Emmanuel is present with us, having promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us, for nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. From the birth of the church, the practice of Holy Communion has been a constant expression of that union between God and his bride. It is the doctrine and practice of the Anglican expression of that church that this act of communion be administered by those duly ordained and for the people accordingly gathered. In a time when, for any reason, the faithful are unable to gather or the ordained are unable to preside, the administration of communion cannot be carried out to the satisfaction of the Anglican practice. While such times deny our access to the sacrament, the underlying union between God and his church, of which it is an expression, remains an undiminished reality. In celebration of this unshakable union, I invite you to meditate upon these words from Scripture, and in the absence of the sacrament, to engage your senses in symbols of remembrance, as a way of actively waiting for our return to it, trusting that the one of whom we there partake can never be taken from us. During his ministry, Jesus taught that he himself was the true food and drink of life. Now the Passover was at hand and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Before his passion, Jesus taught that he himself was the Passover meal of a new covenant. While Jesus and his disciples were eating, he took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. After his resurrection, Jesus continued his pattern at table, as St. Luke recalls. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. And in this same act, the resurrected Christ opened the eyes of two disciples on the road to Emmaus to see him for who he was and is. And so the very first Christians retained this practice in obedience to the command of Christ, gathering around the tables of their own homes. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. As the church grew, it received from the Lord Jesus' own pattern for remembrance, as the apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Having remembered the words of our Lord and the first practices of his church with regard to communion, let us now engage in a symbol of remembrance and longing for it. Take a moment. We'll pull away for a, a, a silent screen. And please partake of the unconsecrated bread and wine that you have.
Dear family of God, nothing can separate us from his presence or love. We eagerly await our reunion with each other and with the sacrament of Holy Communion, just as the Eucharist itself invites us to long for a future day when our union with God and each other will be unmitigated and full. As we move now to abiding in God's presence, I want to invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's join our voices together as we sing.
Okay, brothers and sisters, we come now to the blessing. And uh, as you've heard me say, this comes from the Kenyan Book of Common Prayer and it involves your body. So would you please reach out your hands to this cross or if there's another cross that is nearby and available to you, extend your hands toward it. All the problems of this life on earth, we send to the cross of Christ. All the difficulties of our circumstances, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's work from his temporary power, we send to the cross of Christ. And lifting our hands upward where the resurrected Christ is, all our hopes for wholeness and eternal life, we set on the risen Christ. Christ, the son of righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let's join our voices together now in our final doxology. And I'll be back to give you a word of where we go from here. Blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures here below. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia! Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, praise Him, oh. Well, brothers and sisters, we've come to the end of our live liturgy for this second Sunday in the season of Eastertide. Um, I, I want to give you some instructions of what to do now. I don't want you to just disappear because we have some really great options for you. First of all, you know, if you've been with us for some time, that we have these uh, we have uh, um, Christian education seminars, and we have one that is going on today. Uh, we finished up Randy Lemke's on jazz relative to Lent a little while back. And on this Sunday, we start one from Drew Armstrong about the creed. So I want to encourage you to go from this event to that event. We've situated it just like this sort of a, a Facebook um, premiere video. So it's, it's going to be airing uh, and we can all participate in real time. Uh, by simply going from this over to that video. So I, I'm going to be there and I hope you'll join me there. If you don't join us there, of course, there are always resources on the Live Liturgy webpage. You can see uh, other ways to continue the, the, the moment of worship and also uh, a ways of fellowshipping. I wanna invite you, if you haven't heard me say it already, please feel free to sign up on the Live Liturgy page. You'll see a link to sign up for a 15 minute phone call with me so I can catch up with you and pray for you over the phone. I'd love to do that. And lastly, um, we're not just going to shut the video down as soon as I stop talking, but we're going to give, again, sort of a, a, a several minutes long uh, tail to this video. And that just gives uh, us two opportunities. One is to post up on the screen uh, links and different things for you to try out, resources we might have for you. And secondly, it gives you the chance to, um, to, to continue the conversation on Facebook through the comments if you want to do that. So... Let's enjoy the rest of our time together as this video winds down, and I hope to see you over at the seminar for the Creed. God bless you guys.